the RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com. Hello and welcome to the RTE Rugby Podcast. I'm Michael Glennon and I'm joined on the panel today by Eddie O'Sullivan and Fiona Hayes. We're going to talk Heineken Champions Cup. We'll have a chat about the URC and maybe touch on Ireland's trip to New Zealand, which is later on in the summer. A bit like Leinster, let's get straight into it, folks. Lots of praise for Leo Cullen's side. Uh, they beat Toulouse 40 points to 17. Uh, Leinster scored four tries. Toulouse got a breakaway try and a pushover near the end. Eddie, in their four Champions Cup successes, there's been a lot of impressive performances, but where did this one rate for you uh, amongst the great Leinster showings? Um. I'd have to say I was pretty much right up there, you know. I mean, there was there was mitigation there for 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 uh, Toulouse for sure. But the thing about it is, you're in a Champions Cup semi final. You play a team like Toulouse, who are pretty much loaded up with internationals, and you never look like losing, you know. And it was a bit like that. It was a bit like Leicester, the Leicester game. Never looked like losing. I did patches where they had to work hard, you know, and but it, it was never. There was no point. Where I said, "Oh, Leinster are in a bit of trouble here." They were never really in trouble. You know, they had to work hard at the set times, but that's to be expected. So when a team is winning those caliber of games, it, like in their comfort zone almost, um, you've got to think this is a serious outfit. You know, there isn't, it's going to take a hell of a, it's going to take a hell of a deal to beat them or something's got to happen to change the, 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 the momentum against them. And they didn't, they haven't played well all the time. If you take the Leicester game. Yes. And, um, you look at that Leicester game, you know, they didn't have a particularly good performance, particularly in the second half. They brought a lot of pressure on themselves. Uh, if they look back and I'm sure they did, their edges were very poor. They got themselves in a tangle in their own half a few times. And they, but again, they absorbed a mountain of pressure from the top team in the premiership. And yeah, they got it done again. They, and and I, I thought last year was probably even better, you know, that they were in control the whole time. Now, I suppose some mitigation. Um, Toulouse probably took a lot of Toulouse beat Munster, you know, the whole day, uh, you know, the overtime, the everything. And Munster, to be fair, really put it up to him. You know, no question about that. It was probably Munster's best European performance for a few years where they did a lot of things really well. And they needed that rub of the green that they didn't get, which is, you know, it's it's, it's a bit of a gut punch for them because they could well be, they could well be playing Lens this weekend. But I think... Toulouse came to town. They had a big shift under their belt against Munster. Back to the same stadium. Uh, a home crowd against you again for the second week. Uh, but I still think, given, given, given them the benefit of the doubt on that, look, Leicester, to me, were in control from the off. And that's scary thought. When you're at that level of a tournament and you can give a performance like that where you'd never look in trouble, that's extraordinary to me in a, a, a European tournament level. Yeah, and I think at least we, we, we could come back to that mitigation for Toulouse in a while, but for this performance, Leinster, Fiona, they deserve the plaudits that come their way. Let, let's just take a good day when we when we get it and, and sing the praises. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it wasn't the battle we expected, but Leinster were so clinical. They were unbelievable. I thought um, they were excellent at line-out time. You know, Tyke Furlong left the pitch. There might have been... Um, you might have been a little bit worried at scrum time, but look, they, they, they gave away a couple of penalties, I think, but they were they were they were composed throughout. Johnny Sexton, probably one of the best games I've seen him playing in a long time. Van der Fleer, you probably about six players looking at you, putting their hand up for, for a player of the game. They were just Ross Maloney, another guy who, who should get huge plaudits. They were just brilliant. They their free free flow and style of rugby. We saw Johnny pulling the strings in 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 attack, but it was just just the interlinking before Furlong went off that beautiful pass he skipped out to the wing. I mean, they have the ability to do that everywhere. I think there was cause for him to, to go into 12 next week if he's fit, but it just shows you, you know, how they've worked on their skills, how they've worked in the in the contact area. And you saw them bring that. They might have been a little bit lax against Leicester in the second half, but they knew the job at hand and they went out and they put the, the foot to, and they put the sword to, to that to lose squad who are definitely tired, but Massive plaudits for Leinster. Yeah, and Johnny Sexton there, he, he did get the man of the match or the star of the match, what they're calling it these days. And I know there was talk about him kind of tempering his game, but there are other playmakers coming in. So when he gets the ball, he's flat to the line as he was in the past and he's mm -hmm. taking the hits and he's putting himself in the target line. But there's other guys stepping into the 
into the playmaker yeah. role. So, I mean, that's where he gets his an extra bit of longevity. Eddie, yeah. was it important that he adapted his game as he does age? Yeah, I think Chinese longevity is is down to a number of factors. Um, and what you're talking about there is 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 one of them. But I don't think that it's the main ones. Like uh, the the main ones for me is that obviously. He's an extraordinary professional. Like I don't think there's a minute goes by that Johnny Six isn't thinking how he's going to get better at his game, even despite the fact of what he's achieved and where he is in his career. It's just it's, which is always a sign of a great player. They're on, they're constantly driving themselves to get better. They're never happy. Even even when they win, you talk to one that the you know these these generational type players. They're never they'll still find flaws in what happened. So there's that drive he has, which means. Every moment of his day is about he's been a professional rugby player and what it requires. So then the second thing, which is kind of nothing to do with that in some ways, but very, very important, is our management system of our players in Ireland. So Johnny Sexton, you know, is treated like somebody who's indispensable, which in a way, I suppose you could say that. But the point is, the amount of uh, game, number of games he plays, his game time, has all been managed right through his career. This has not happened last week or last year. This is going on since he joined the Irish team. We've been managing our players, like, you know, from from almost not so much season to season, but week to week, yeah. going on um, 20 years now. I'll tell and you, Ugo Mola, Eddie, just on that, Ugo Mola said that the two the two out halves were swapping their jerseys after the match, uh, one, 136, 122 years of age. Yeah. Uh, Johnny had played 12 matches this season and... The other uh, remote remain into Mac twenty seven. Yeah, that's the, that's the, that's a massive. That's the big difference. Yeah, you know. So the, the fact that the, he's so professional, that's credit to him. The system, and then you're right. I think he's more selective about his contact area. I think if you go back to him a number of years ago, he was almost looking for contact. Now he still won't shy away from it. Mm. You know, um, and the same on defense. He doesn't shy away from defense. Where you you know they come at him because they expect him. But I think he's. He's got smarter as well. His techniques improved in the tackle. He used to put himself in bad positions years yeah. ago. And he was getting dinged. You know, he's getting his bell wrong more than he needs to. Um, but so all those things help him. So, like, that's a, that's a major factor. He's been managed so well. But here's the thing, you know, I think is really important um, is what Sexton has now in terms of his knowledge and experience of the game is colossal, right? It, it, like, you know, you can't buy experience and knowledge. You just learn. And he's been in so many high-pressure situations now over his career with Leinster and with Ireland, you know, talking about beating the All Blacks, winning the Grand Slam, you know, um, Leinster winning, uh, you know, the Heineken Cup and so forth. He, he's, his bank of knowledge is colossal. And what a lot of players don't get the opportunity to play with that bank of knowledge because their body breaks down. Fellas break down at 29-30. Yeah. But he's now in his golden years with all that knowledge. He's in phenomenal shape fitness-wise. So now he's in his own. He's in his zone like where he's he's playing so comfortably with the ball because of his knowledge. And it's that's an it, it's an it's a fantastic thing to see. But that's all uh, uh, that's all a consequence of how his career has been managed and how he's managed himself. So yeah, that's why I think like at the moment it's hard to find a number ten in the world that is in a better place in terms of, of his game. But that's not an accident. It's not just one of the things that happened. It was, it's not a happenstance. It's, it's actually the result of all the strategizing. Um, so that reason, I think that's, a, and we can talk about what the impact that level in the final, but that's, that's why at the moment for me, Sexton is really in the zone. Uh, and you see him pulling the trigger at key moments. He's so smart. And the second try was peach yeah. because, you know, their third defender off, 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 off him, uh, the prop, you know, for some crazy reason, bit down on dummy runners, which is like, thanks for the use of the hall moment. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> then he tried, jumped over the line and, and essentially just skinned them on the outside. Yeah. So that, um, like, that, that's that sort of knowledge under pressure. That's, that's, that's top drawer stuff. So my point is, he's in a long, long way, he's, he's, not getting, he's not getting any worse. He's getting better. <laughs> yeah. That's why <laughs> his age and his experience. Yeah. So, you know, that's I, a massive for Leinster. Yeah. You know, and, and then you have someone like, the Burns, you know, Ross and Harry Byrne, who were really world-class players, yeah. were really, you know, were water carriers from, you know, but that's the way it is, you know, he's, he's that's where he is at the moment. So that to me is a massive thing for Leinster, yeah. massive for Leinster and Ireland, by the way.
Absolutely. And the, the, the dummy he threw on Rory Arnold, I mean, I knew I played with forwards with and against who didn't know what a dummy was, so there was no point in trying to throw one. Arnold was, only, Arnold was a collateral damage. <laughs> yeah, I mean... God, he had the, 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 I think it's the tight head prop, Andres. Yeah, yeah. Andre was the guy who bit down to, on, on Ryan. He had no need to bite down on Ryan because yeah. Ryan was covered. Mm-hmm. And then he had a, an old shit moment and said, oh, yeah, yeah. I shouldn't be here. <laughs> Turned his shoulders and jumped out of the line. So, like... You know, Arnold was just at the, Arnold was just at the collateral damage. Yeah, yeah. Like he was never going to get sexton. So I mean, but that sort of knowledge under pressure at the game line. Yeah. Um, but I do think you're right. I go back to your original point. Um, he's more he's 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 much more selective about when he takes contact now. And you see him, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that to me is I I, I think if if I'm coaching a team, the last guy I want at the bottom of a rock is my ten. Of course, of course. You know, because he needs yeah, to be no there. He's no use exactly. there. Exactly. His other guys can do that for you, you know? Yeah. Um, Fiona, James Lowe, he got himself into the shortlist for the European Player of the Year after being left off the, the long list. And Josh van der Fleer there as well. He's probably going to pick up a Rugby Players Award tonight, more than likely. Um, who else impressed you on Saturday? Uh, Ross Maloney as well, one of the forwards that stood out. Yeah, Ross Maloney was brilliant. You know, I, I had talked about second rows. I had heard mumblings um, last week that James Moyd possibly could have been injured but and obviously he was worried about that area but you know Ross Maloney stepped in and Ryan with him and he just put in he a colossal performance and this is what you want from these guys you know it's your time to shine he's up at the Viva it's a it's a semi-final and he brought the type of rugby we hadn't seen him he's inter he's interlinking play for a second row his hands are really really soft he was really really good in the, in the line out I've heard um you know I, I heard I read an article Bernard Jackman saying that he's instrumental in the call and, and and Leo Collins also said he's in the meetings even if he's not starting he's just a, a, a really good knowledge and unfortunately probably with his age we now he could be a bolter for the tour but we we mightn't see him in an Irish jersey he's reaching that peak level of playing of performance but I suppose it's the young guys you'll have to look at coming through go, going there now but he was really really good Gibson Park I thought controlled everything really really well and um, look Al Alatoa Al- he he had to come on. He had to, you know, no one expected Tyg Furlong to go on. I was thinking in the back of my head, would, this early in the game, would they quite possibly bring Healy on and and move Porter over to the other side? But but they stuck with him. And look, he got stuck in. He done his job. Might have been a, it might have been a bit under pressure at scrum time, but I thought around the pitch, although Lencer had a lot of ball, I thought he done really well off the ball as well. I thought his tackle tech was really good. So there, there was just a numerous performances. And obviously you talked about... Uh, Caelan or uh, Van der Fleer what about uh, Doris as well in the back yeah. row he was just everywhere and every game I see him playing he's getting better and better he's absolutely lapping it up and he, he's turned him to himself into one of the, the world players as well he's someone that is definitely one to watch in this tour yeah the one the one Mayo let get away I mean how many, <laughs> many All-Irelands would Mayo have had if they had kept him <laughs> kept him up there and he played there and um, I was talking to Felipe Contaponi during the week. He, he's obviously, he's going to move on to the, the Pumas, but he nearly hung up on me on, when I suggested that maybe Leinster are the only team that can beat Leinster uh, or can stop Leinster from winning a, a Champions Cup. Um, I, was, I watched the La Rochelle match and I went back to watch highlights again um, on the Champions Cup website. The highlights start at 25 minutes in is the first piece of action. Um, the, and finished, uh, finished at 25, 30 seconds. It was five minutes long and two minutes of that was referees. God, it was hard, but, well, you know, I was watching it like everybody else and, and in the back of your mind, you're, you well, can't help but comparing it to the day before. Mm. And it was nowhere near. Like I thought both teams were tactically very poor, uh, technically quite poor. A lot, of, a lot of stars on the field, a lot of power, raw power, but it was just a slugfest in a beautiful day. Yeah, you know, yeah. um, where it was made for running rugby. Uh, it was a classic, like, grind out result. I thought, look, credit to La Rochelle and Raj for getting there, but they, they dodged a bullet. Like, I mean, Teddy Thomas should have passed that ball. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, like, he, like, he should be wearing his ass for a hat after that, you know? Like, it was just unbelievable that a player at that level didn't execute a two on one with a game on the line. Yeah. It was a walk in. And and that happened that Racing would have probably won it, but I just I just don't think Racing um, are as good as people make out. You know they're not they're not greater than some of their parts. They've got some great players, and again, you know Finn Russell has be got the shepherd's crook. Yeah, you know he's 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 supposed to be you know your genius at ten. Uh, 
you know, so like, so I, I think La Rochelle did really well to come out the other side of that, which means that I think they're, 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 they're definitely not favourites going into it for a number of reasons. Okay, but 12, Lens are 12 point favourites mm. this far out uh, to go to the south of the, France. Probably the biggest problem for La Rochelle is, uh, and, and the difference is the time we talked about, look at the two tens, you know, there's no comparison and no. that's not taken away from their 10, but he's not a place kicker either. No, he missed it. He missed he's, yeah, yeah. five kicks west. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. He, he just, he's, and that's been his MO in fairness. Like he, he's not a, he's not a, He's not a world-class place kicker, you know. And going into a final without a place kicker is a massive, you know, it's a massive thing to do. So, like, on that basis of the two fly halves, you have to think that, of course, Leinster are favourites. Now, look, a final is a final is a final, you know. I mean, on the day, a yellow card at the wrong time, a red card, uh, the scrum gets under pressure, yeah. the ref sees it differently, and you're suddenly leaking penalties every scrum. It's a wet day. It just rains that particular day and yeah. you can't get that fluid game plan. It's down to a slugfest or the breakdown. Like, there's, there's a myriad of things that go into a final that you don't want to go wrong, but they could go wrong and they could change the game. But going on as both teams sit, yeah, Leinster are 12-point favourites. I think that's not an exaggeration. And that's no disrespect to La Rochelle. I thought they did a really good shift to get over, get over Racing. But they were... They, they were got the rub of the green a little bit as well. I mean, Racing's kind of self imploded as they tend to do. Yeah, and I, Fiona, I don't want to talk down too much about La Rochelle, yeah. but at one stage they were two points up and they were mm-hmm. playing against 13 men. They got a breakaway, and all I can think in my head is you know, recycle a couple of phases, a couple of passes, let it happen. And all of a sudden, this guy throws an offload Lose. and they give away a penalty and they don't score against the, the 13 men. And I was just thinking, that you would need that. I love, yeah, the the joue joue, but there has to come a point in a cup semi final where you just switch on and be clinical. Yeah, and we've seen that with Larishel. We saw him when they beat Leinster, so they definitely have that in their armor. And I think O'Gara has parts of that brought to the game. I mean, I know you were talking about Io West, but I thought his kicking game has improved massively under O'Gara. Um, he missed three kicks, which was really unusual, and they were center, they were there, thereabouts in front of the post. Um, I it was just a strange game from start to finish. When I watched it, you just wanted, like we know both teams at times, especially Racing, are liable to do anything. And that keep the ball alive, as you said, Michael, they definitely overplayed things at time. And I think pressure came on when the two players went off. Instead of just settling things down, drawing that defence in and, and then going wide when when the, the, the defence was narrow with the two players out, they didn't seem to do that. It was almost like it, everything went out the window and they forgot where they were. I do think with that we know Kerr Barlow went off early in the second half as well he's massive for that Rochelle team and he's now going to be missing and when Retieri I think it's Retieri came on um I'm not great at the old French pronouncing, but um, I don't think he controlled the game as well. Um, he doesn't have that re- same relationship. Uh, Carbarlo and uh, West have built up a nice playing relationship. We see that they they play well together. I don't think he has the same thing. So O'Gara is going to have to go back and look at that. Um, I think it will be a different team that we saw. We know they're physically dominant. There is talk, maybe, maybe Will Skelton might come back into this side, but I'm not sure how fit he, he's going to be. We know how, how not how bad but we know Will Skelton isn't great when he's not fit we, we saw that with Saracens um, so I'm not sure he hasn't had much game time obviously he's a huge presence but I think Leinster are capable of dealing with any big ball carriers at the minute um, scrum time they will be attacked we know that Antonio Priest are really good scrummagers and, and they will go for them in that area um, I, I, I predicted a really good game I, I was looking forward to I was waiting all day Sunday to watch it and it, it certainly wasn't that but I don't think we'll see similar style of play from from uh, La Rochelle I think he'll change things up we know that they are quite physical but I think I think they'll be a little bit more structured and they'll have to be against the Leinster team very good that match is on Saturday week it's 28th of May at 4.45 kickoff you can catch it we'll have a live blog on our website and it'll be on RTE radio as well and um, before that we will turn to the URC it's uh, Leinster will host Munster on Saturday evening at the Aviva Leinster already guaranteed home quarter fi- home quarter Semi if they get there and final if they get that far. Munster, on the other hand, need a win to guarantee a home quarter. Um, that's if Ed Sheeran doesn't come up with a surprise <laughs> concert and, and, and take home in the game. Um, they need a try bonus win 
if they want to get if they want to guarantee a second seed for the semi-finals. Um, looks like uh, a Leinster second string, obviously, Eddie. Um, how do you see this one going with, with something on the line, really, for Munster and not much for Leinster? Well, yeah, there's no doubt there's a lot of pressure on Munster for this game. Not just the fact that they you know, want to cement their position into a home uh, into a home quarter, but if they could, if they lose to a Leinster second string, that's just going to set their season back. That'll take a lot of the the glow out of the, the Toulouse performance. That's a fact. You can dice it any way you want, but that's that's reality. Um, I think you know they'll go they'll go full out on it, and I think they'll win it. I think Monster win it. I think they should win it. They shouldn't struggle to win it either, because even if they win it and it's a struggle. It's it just like what what Munster did on the weekend is they need to go out like a well-oiled machine and just take Leinster apart. Now, will that happen? I don't know. Leinster have a still decent second string, but the perception is perception will be because if Munster stutter on the weekend, like losing isn't an option for them because that would be a real setback. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the whole psychology of it, but even if they stutter to get across Leinster. Um, it, it, it will be kind of a blow to their confidence because they're, they're in a great space. I mean, even uh, the, all the talk about Munster after the after the after the game against uh, Toulouse was massively positive. You know, if you didn't know the results, you'd think they won. Yeah. yeah. Which is an interesting narrative, you know, but it was hard not to be, you know, to be positive the way they played. But actually, you know, they still lost the game, but they still got a massive boost out of it because they played so well. That can evaporate pretty quickly at the back end of the season from, and I'm just talking about next Saturday, I'm talking about how they play out the URC. Yeah. So it starts next Saturday against Leinster second string, and people might be offended by saying that, but let's call a, a spade a shovel here. You know, it is a second string, and they've got to win that game pretty comfortably without too much fuss, or it's the doubts that maybe, you know, to lose as a one-off and we're not where we thought we'd be, all that comes into play. And, you know, once they're chasing silverware, they need to get to a final. So it's a lot of pressure on Munster. There's no pressure on Leinster here. Yeah. Nothing vital, to lose for them. Vital they build on that, um, Fiona. Yeah, they have to. You know, they have to go out there and win. Um, I suppose uh, from the Leinster point of view, you have a few guys as well who are trying to get on that Champions Cup um, or the Heineken Cup squad final. You know, so there, there's guys have a chance to play their way into that. We saw Ross Maloney playing well in the URC and then he was rewarded. So they definitely, they have a, a, there's going to be guys with the bit in between their teeth trying to go out and tear into Munster. But there's no option. Munster have to win. They've, they've built their performances up from the last few since that Leinster game actually we've seen them improve in attack and and you know there has been a lot of chatter about that and how exciting it, it it's it's been at times um obviously can get a lot more exciting so so look i think it is the only thing with Munster is they have a good few injuries. I think I, I saw the injury list. So you're looking at maybe Peter Omani being out and a few other kind of leaders. Um, that I think Diolande, there's talk that he might be injured as well. So, so a few big uh, key players will be missing as well. But look, that's what it's all about. And they've built the squad depth to be able to get guys to step up and play. And I think um, I think Munster, after that two days game, they, they'd be wanting to go out and go back to Aviva and prove a point. So it should make for an interesting game, really. Very good. That's uh, Saturday at quarter past seven, um, and that's on RT Radio as well. Ulster are fifth in the table. They have the Sharks at home, and Vic, do the leapfrog over them with a with a home quarter final. The last thing Ulster need is a is a trip back down to South Africa for a for a quarter final. Um, we were talking to Dan McFarlane during the week. He said he didn't enjoy the the quarter finals or the semi finals. Looking on, as you can imagine, looking maybe where they thought they should have been, um, in Toulouse's place, but. Eddie, they, they, they lost to Munster, sorry, to Munster at home after the, the Toulouse win, which you could understand. Had a great win away in Edinburgh, um, who hadn't been beaten at home all season. So Ulster and, and had a bit of time off now. Um, what would you think for, for that game? Could you get a job done at home? Yeah, I think they will. But there's no doubt, there's no question or doubt that Ulster season has hit a wobble. Whether we like it or not, you know, like they, they know they left the Heineken Cup behind them in terms of staying in the, in the, in the fight and then that last the monster like again that's rattled their cage a wee bit I know they've recovered a bit as well but look they're, they're they've had the problem monster have over the years historically is they've had fantastic patches in their seasons but when they've come to the crunch part of the season they've like they, I remember a number of years they were top of the 
the Pro 14 table or whatever it was at the time, or whatever ideation we had on it, uh, at Christmas. And then they were fighting for, you know, to, to get into the playoffs. And they've hit that kind of a wobble again. So I think they'll get it done. And it's important to get it done, you know, for all the obvious reasons yeah. of ending up in that spot on the table. But um, it'll have to come down to the day if, they, if things stick for them and they, the crowd will get behind them. And there'll be, there'll be a lot of energy in the stadium. It's, it's, you know, they do feed off the, they're no more than one star length, so they feed off the crowd really well. Kind of like the same. So that's important to them. But uh, I think they get it done. But I, I don't they're over the woods getting it done, but they're another step closer getting over the woods. They are in a wobbly place at the moment for yeah. various reasons. But I, 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 I sense they'll get this one done. But is that going to be, you know, this is going to turn the season around? We'll have to see. You know, it's still going to take another couple of big performances going back to where they were, you know, before they hit the wobble, you know. Yeah, they need a second wind, Fiona. Um, if, they, if, they, if they want to push on again and be in the, the hunt for silverware. Yeah, definitely. And this is this is kind of a game they should be looking forward to. We know what the Sharks bring. They're they're very physical. I mean, but they're exciting. They've got Man Pee, they've they've a few really good players. You got Kerwin Bosch at 10. They they offer a lot. We saw them probably, you know, at home. They're a different, they're they're a different thing team to deal with. They they build on that, and obviously it's harder to go to South Africa and play them over there. So so I think Ulster will be looking at this as probably a must-win game. They they know what they up in Kingspan, they know what the Crowd has been like this year. It's got them through a good few games. Obviously, we've seen them wobble near the end. Um, it's not the performances they're talking about winning cups, and just when it comes to crunch time, it doesn't seem to be happening for them. They have the exciting players, so I I think that this will be a huge game, and it'll be huge for us to judge on where they are now in the season. They've got a few weeks to work together. You know, they've had a couple of weeks off now, and after that, uh, lost to Toulouse, I'm sure they had to regroup and and look at mental side of things as well, and look at why they can't finish off these teams so so I think we'll see a different unit and I think they will probably hopefully injury free a lot of the guys I don't think they have very many injury concerns in the squad at the minute as well so we should see a, a full strength ultra squad and they should beat this Sharks team yeah, that's in terms of in terms of form we have, Michael though, the one thing to watch is that if you look at the form like Sharks have won their last three matches on the bounce they yeah. lost you know the three out of four you know Ulster are, are one out of four yeah yeah like that's that's where me that probably is the as Fiona was saying, they're going to need something to jolt them back into the zone. Yeah, and and uh, this comes and that's the that's the pressure for them on Saturday. Like, no. it's not the end of the world if they lose, mm. but it might be the beginning of the end of the world if they lose. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. they need to get their mojo back somehow, and and Saturday is the first step in that, and that's why I think psychologically Saturday is a massive game for Ulster. Yeah, yeah. The, it's it's up the top four inches for Ulster on Saturday, really. Very good, yeah. That that's a Friday night match. Um. I, actually up in the Kingspan uh, 7.35 and we will have um, Connick v Zebras the dead rubber on Saturday that, but it's on 5 o'clock on RT2 and the RT player um, so maybe yeah, the Ulster Sharks match is going to be the, the, the match with most on it this weekend one would, one would think or the closest one um, from this distance uh, big news this week was Fiona won the lottery and she's <laughs> off to New Zealand uh, for the summer um, as are the Irish rugby team and they're going to played New Zealand Maori twice as well. That was announced during the week that they have two midweek games. And um, Eddie, when you were there, and you, I think you capped uh, Luke, you would have capped Luke Fitzgerald. And we, we don't see that many young guys like 1920 getting capped first time in Ireland. I mean, maybe just the way the system is, but is there someone you would like to see, maybe Nathan Doak or someone like that to go there, get a cap, show in the deep end, What's this? What's the yeah. mentality or the, the well, thinking around capping or not capping? Uh, well, I mean, when you guys that age, when, when you go to New Zealand, uh, you need all your hands on deck. You know, you're not. It's, it's not a. It's not a summer holiday, really. And you, when you get there, you realize it's not summer anyway. You know, there's winter. So, you know, I think the Maori games are going to be where you're going to see guys get a run out. I think that's and that was. I think that was the whole. I think it's a great idea. Mm. He's going to be a lot more players though. It's not like he's going down there with. The bones of a squad is going to put together, going to chop it and change it. He's going down there with 40 or 42 players. I have to laugh now when I see that because remember there was there was chaos uh, back in 2005 when um, when when the Lions tour uh, and and oh, yeah. Um, yeah you know uh, Woodward brought 40 players or 42 players. Right. People lost their mind. Now we bring you know you 
and that was a full on. That was a, that was a two games a week tour, a full on line store. How many did you have when you were down there? Uh, we always played. Uh, we always played just two tests down there. Uh, but what we did, what my first year is we brought, we got a midweek game uh, against the county side. Uh, but that was unusual. Now the reason, like the reason those old tours are gone, is just that. Uh, playing two the rugby has changed. Playing two games a week now is a huge demand on players, and it's the end of the season as well. Um, so you know it made sense not to beast guys to death midweek and then try and play. So I think this move, and it's a smart move by by Andy Farrell to go over the Maori Maori games. Yeah. I think it's his chance to get some younger guys. Going back to your question, who would I um, who would I like to see? Um, Certainly, I'd like to see Nathan Doak get a run, get a run under. Balakun's another guy I'd love to see getting a run. Ross Maloney, I think, should get down there. Like no question about it. Um, I also think um, Prendergast in Connacht. Mm. Yeah, you know, he's, he's been the standout guy for the year yeah. for me in Connacht. He's been outstanding. So there's a there's four. Like, Again, there's more of them there, but there are guys who've been kind of. We're going to find it hard maybe to break in in the autumn when the rubber hits the road. Like So it's a great chance. Of, and the other thing you can't underestimate is touring is tough in terms of you're away from home, you're stuck in hotels, you know, um, you're know, you tired at the end of the season. But the, the value of being on tour away from home on the move, with a, like it, it actually builds a great kind of um, camaraderie and rapport on the squad. It's very hard to describe it. Like, but it is great because they, they they also tend to relax a bit off the field, and there's a great energy around the team. And, and if you have a good summer tour, you can build on it for the for the autumn. I remember in 2004, uh, we went to South Africa and we had two tests in South Africa, um, one in Bloemfontein and, and one in Cape Town, and we lost both those tests. But we played actually really well in those tests. We really got our shoulder to the wheel. And I really felt, I remember saying to the lads in the change room after that, because they were coming up that autumn, they were our first game that autumn, I said to the lads in the change room, I guarantee we'll beat them in the autumn, because I just knew we had what it took, and we, we, were, we were burned out by the time we got to those tests, like to the end of the season, players were playing a lot more than they are now even, in terms of the number of games out there having, so I just felt we had the core of a team, and we did beat them for the first time in years, they came up that autumn under Jake White, and to me, the tour was the foundation of that autumn victory. So there's a lot of things there that are valuable. Now, the risk with New Zealand, which is probably a bigger risk than other countries, is it can go pear-shaped. And if a tour goes pear-shaped, if you're getting whipped on the field, it just sucks the morale out of guys. Because then, if it, you know, we, you, normally when things are going well, you get up in the morning, you feel tired at the end of the season, you kind of go, oh, yeah, but we're nearly there. But if you get up in the morning, you're getting snot beaten out of you. Uh, that fatigue feels worse. So I, I think that if it, the tour, it, New Zealand is a, is a dangerous tour because it can suck a lot of energy out of it. If you get, things go badly wrong, it can really take the wind out of your sails. And then let's be honest, New Zealand are waiting in the tall grass for us here. You know, like <laughs> they're yes. still smarting from last, they're still smarting from November. They haven't forgotten that. No, of course they will be. I wonder, is there a mentality shift, Fiona, in that the last time Ireland toured down there, they would never have beaten New Zealand before that. So now, once there have been what three wins um, yeah. over New Zealand, that that is gone. So that thing that we can never beat New Zealand is gone. And that obviously, if they if they hit their straps and go under day, they can they can pull it all out. But the, the thing of we can beat this, or we we have done it recently, must come into play as well. Yeah, definitely. And Ireland will be going there confident enough. I know you can't, it's easy for me to say going to New Zealand confident, but it's definitely, you know, I, I, I've watched this New Zealand team, you know, they're, they're still missing a few key area players. I mean, their back row isn't as settled as, as they would have been over the years. Um, I'm watching the Super 15, some of the, the key players that they would normally be relying on aren't probably playing the best rugby their lives either. So I think it will be a very interesting uh, tour down there. They're trying to get their 
their squad ready, I suppose, for the up and coming World Cup. They're trying to pick these guys and gel them together. And we know at home and everything, the crowds down there, it's going to be, and we know the physicality that they bring. It's absolutely immense. But I think this Irish team, you know, are on the back of a few wins. I thought it was a very good Six Nations campaign. Um, Ireland are probably hurting over France, you know, because it was it was it was close. And they'll be looking at these tests that's going down there and really stamping their mark on the world and saying to people, look, we've just won here in New Zealand. We've won a series in New Zealand and we're and we're looking at the next World Cup. So it's a, it's a chance for guys to go in. And, you know, you talked about the, the Maori games. I think that's really, really important, especially if they're moving tournaments or changing how 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 tournaments are going forward. I think there has to be opportunities. Are, are they capped, actually? Are they capped, Michael? They are. I would say they're non-capped. I, I okay. They're non-capped. Oh, they're non-capped. Okay, well, I was just... But even to these guys to get the experience of playing at that level, I mean, we've had the Maori All Blacks have gone to the games in, in Towan Park. They they bring immense passion. They, You know, it's a, it's a very physical game and there's loads of young guys, old guys, whoever, that deserve to be playing in an Ireland shirt, but because the, the competition is so high at the minute, it's, it's very hard, whereas now they get to go together in a big group and people could maybe make a stamp in one of the games and make their way onto the bench for the next game. So it's exciting to be able to bring a large squad away and it's really really good business by the RFU. If you look at it as well Michael the the kind of what's the, the cockpit chatter in New Zealand regarding rugby um, I think they're, there's, a, there's a bit of unease in New Zealand that they're not really developing that they're kind of stuck in a little bit of a, a inertia in their game um, the criticism seems to be coming out of New Zealand uh, of themselves is that they're not innovating anymore, they're playing a similar type game to everybody else. So, like, you know, the next World Cup is huge for them as well because, like, like South Africa won the last World Cup, New Zealand went out of it, uh, semi-final stage. Like, New Zealand were all about winning World Cups and they had a drought there for years that nobody would have predicted. Um, so if they, if, they don't, if they don't feature in the next World Cup again, you know, they'll start to feel very uneasy about their place in, in, in the World Cup. Uh, which is massive for them. So um, there is a certain unease down there, and you know their teams are 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 not maybe as polished as they were in, in previous Super Rugby. The Australian teams are getting closer to them. Uh, so is it that Australia are getting better or New Zealand aren't moving on? There's a lot of that talk going on at the moment. So if Ireland were to rock up in June and win a Test series in New Zealand, there'd be a lot of emergency buttons pushed mm. in New Zealand. So this is why it's, they're going to come out like with all the guns blazing. Um, so for that reason, this will test us. This will be a, this will test us for sure. It'd be, I wouldn't t- I wouldn't take it off the table. We we I think we could win a test down there, which would be phenomenal to do it again. Another another glass ceiling broken for the team for the Irish rugby team. Uh, if we won a series, it'd be it'd be it'd be ridiculous because it's very hard to win a series in New Zealand. Even the Lions can't do that a lot of the time, you know. Yeah, no, we don't want to give them too much time to get it right anyways if there's a World Cup <laughs> yeah. down the road as well. So we'll see what happens. Okay, guys, thanks very much for joining us on the RT podcast this week and we'll chat to you all next week. Cheers, Mike. Cheers. The RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com.